Hi and welcome to God's house. Thank you for once again joining us to participate in these remote worship opportunities during the season of Lent. We've reached the fifth midweek service. Uh, we continue our study of the book of Hebrews and how the book of Hebrews talks about how important Jesus' blood is for us and for our salvation. Today we focus on how Jesus has chosen to share our blood. Now, it's a new day and a new day these days means that everything has changed again. New restrictions in place, rising numbers of people infected with the coronavirus, rising numbers of people who have suffered terribly and even died from the virus. And because we are in a world, and especially a time of constant change, it's all the more important that we cling to something that does not change. That's where we find our foundation, not just in these days, but every day of our lives, because life is always changing. As Peter says, uh, we are like the grass. Our glory fades like the flowers of the field. It's here today and gone tomorrow, but the word of the Lord stands forever. That is our foundation, our confidence, and our hope today and every day. May God bless our worship today. Again, you can find our order of service on our website uh, or attached to the email on which you found this service video, so please follow along. The words will also be printed right on the video to help you to participate as easily as possible. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your mercy in the morning, and your faithfulness every night. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own fault, by my own grievous fault. Therefore, I pray for God Almighty to have mercy on me. Forgive me all my sins and bring me to everlasting life. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all of your sins. Amen. We pray. Lord God, our refuge and fortress, your faithfulness has protected us through this day. Now send your holy angels to guard us from danger through this night. Give us peaceful rest, free from fear, that we may wake refreshed to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. We read part five of the Passion History of our Lord. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought this man to me as one who is misleading the people. Look, I have examined him in your presence. I have found in this man no basis for the charges you are bringing against him. Herod did not either, for he sent him back to us. See, he has done nothing worthy of death, so I will have him flogged and released him. At the time of the festival, the governor had a custom to release to the crowd any one prisoner they wanted. At that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner named Barabbas, who had been thrown in prison for rebellion in the city and for murder. The crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do for them what he usually did. So when they were assembled, Pilate said to them, Do you want me to release the king of the Jews to you? Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For Pilate, in fact, knew that they had handed Jesus over to him because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, Pilate's wife sent him a message. Have nothing to do with that righteous man, she said. 
since I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus put to death. The governor asked them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They all shouted together with one voice, Take him away, release Barabbas to us. Pilate said to them, Then what do you want me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? What should I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said to him, Crucify him. But the governor said, Why? What has he done wrong? But they kept shouting even louder, Crucify him. Pilate addressed them again because he wanted to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! He said to them the third time, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no grounds for sentencing him to death, so I will whip him and release him. But they kept pressuring him with loud voices, demanding that he be crucified, and their voices were overwhelming. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, knelt down in front of him, and mocked him by saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spit on him, took the staff, and hit him repeatedly on his head. They also kept hitting him in the face. Pilate went outside again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and guards saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate told them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law. And according to that law, he ought to die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He went back inside the palace again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate asked him, Are you not talking to me? Don't you know that I have the authority to release you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no authority over me at all if it had not been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release Jesus. But the Jews shouted, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside. He sat down on the judge's seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, or Gabbatha in Aramaic. It was about the sixth hour on the preparation day for the Passover. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They shouted, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Should I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, and that instead it was turning into a riot, he decided that what they demanded would be done. He took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd, and said, I am innocent of this righteous man's blood. It is your responsibility. And all the people answered, Let his blood be on us and on our children. Since he wanted to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. So then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. After they had mocked him, the soldiers took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Jesus was carrying his own cross. As they were going out of the city, a certain man, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country. They placed the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd of the people was following him, including women who were mourning and wailing for him. Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me. But weep for yourselves and for your children. Be sure of this. The days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never gave birth and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things to the green wood, what will happen to the dry? This is the passion history of our Lord. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness.
the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The word of God for our consideration today comes to us from the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, beginning at verse 10. Certainly it was fitting for God, the one for whom and through whom everything exists, in leading many sons to glory, to bring the author of their salvation to his goal through sufferings. For he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified all have one Father. For that reason, he is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers. Within the congregation I will sing your praise. And again, I will trust in him. And again, here I am and the children God has given me. Therefore, since the children share flesh and blood, he also shared the same flesh and blood, so that through death he could destroy the one who had the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. For surely he was not concerned with helping angels, but with helping Abraham's offspring. For this reason he had to become like his brothers in every way, in order that he would be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, so that he could pay for the sins of the people. Indeed, because he suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is the word of the Lord. We pray. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. Amen. Your fellow redeemed friends in Christ Jesus, who shared blood with us. You know what today is? It's March 25th. Do you know what else it is? It's Annunciation Day. It's the day the Christian church has set aside to celebrate, to commemorate that, that day when the angel Gabriel came to Mary and announced to her that she was going to become the virgin mother of the Son of God. Can you guess why the church chose March 25th to celebrate the Annunciation of our Lord? It's pretty simple, really. Nine months from today exactly is Christmas. So it makes sense that the church would celebrate Jesus announcement, the announcement of his birth, nine months before he would actually be born. Now, it's just a, a sheer chronological coincidence that we are talking about the Annunciation today because our writing, our text from Hebrews, has everything to do with the facts of Jesus' birth into this world, the, the fact of the incarnation, the fact that the Son of God left his throne in heaven and came down to become one of us, to take on our flesh, to share our blood. Have you noticed that in any time of crisis, and especially in, in this time of crisis during this pandemic, that Many people, and especially public figures, like to pretend that we're all one big, happy human race. That we all worship the same God. That we're all brothers and sisters, even though we may have different faiths and different beliefs and different religions. In their tweets, in their prayer meetings, they want to kind of cast aside every distinction that there is and hold hands with Muslims and Jews and atheists and pretend that we're all praying to the same God for help and for relief in this time of crisis. Uh, that sounds good. It's, it's very heavy on the virtue signaling. It's politically correct, and we might even be tugged to join into it because it seems like the right thing to do, to put aside our differences in this time of crisis and come together as, as one human race, one family of brothers and sisters, and pray to our one God. It sounds good, but it's blasphemy. It's a heresy. It's just not true. We are not one 
with Jews and Muslims and atheists, and we should not pretend to pray to the same God as they do. Consider this. One time Jesus was, was teaching and, and preaching to the people, and uh, some people came in and said that his blood relatives, his mother and his brothers, were looking for him. And, and he looked around at the crowd and he said, Who's my mother? Who are my brothers? My mother and my brother are those who do the will of God. Or has he made it even clear in John chapter 14 where he said, No one comes to the Father except through me. So it might be attractive to, to try to set aside all the differences between religions and faiths and pretend that we're all, we can all come together and be united in prayer to one God in, this, in these days of crisis, but it's just not true. Now, I bring that up for two reasons. First, because I, I think it's worthy of serious consideration in these days. When the temptation is strong to say, oh, you know, our confessions don't matter. What we believe doesn't matter. It just matters that we, we love one another. And, and that's true. You should still take care of your family. Love your neighbor however you can. Help others out in whatever way you can. Share the gospel when you can. But don't ever fall under the illusion that we are all one big happy family under one God because we're not. But the main reason I bring that up is not, is not to, to point out that those distinctions still exist. They, they, they certainly do. But to point out the, the marked contrast between what sin and unbelief has done in our world in dividing us into different religions and different groups and, and also to separate all of us as sinners from God, but more importantly to, to show how Jesus crossed enemy lines. He, he didn't allow sin to keep us separated from him. He became one of us. He took on human flesh. He shared our blood. And the obvious question is, why would he do that? Why would he, he who is the creator, share the blood of his creatures? We know that sharing anything in these times is fraught with risk. We're not even supposed to share the same six feet of oxygen with another person, much less blood. So why did, why did the Son of God share our blood? Hebrews answers that. Hebrews says, he had to become like his brothers in every way so that he could pay for the sins of the people. Indeed, because he suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus had to become one of us, had to share our blood in order to save us. And as one of us, he had to experience everything we do, which includes suffering. Why did Jesus have to suffer? Well, we might often ask, why do we have to suffer? The answer is pretty simple. It's kind of similar to Newton's third law of motion, that every action has an opposite reaction. That's how God designed it right away in the Garden of Eden. He told Adam and Eve, obedience will bring about a reaction, a reward of happiness in life, but disobedience will will bring about a reaction of suffering and death. When we sin, we suffer. That's how God designed it in the beginning. And we know that from personal experience too as well, don't we? We know that when we sin, it's not only others who are hurt, it's often we who are hurt. We often hurt ourselves by our sins. Just take the fourth commandment, for example. The fourth commandment, which says, Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and you may enjoy long life on the earth. When we disobey that commandment, when children disobey their parents or church members dishonor their, their, their called workers, their leaders, when, when citizens disobey their elected leaders, do the, do the leaders suffer? Do God's representatives suffer? Well, certainly they do. Any parent will attest to that. When their child is disobedient, they suffer. But is the flip side of the coin also true? Do those who are disobedient suffer? Well, certainly. It tends to, disobedience tends to bite back. 
You might find that out today if you, uh, if you go out on a non-essential errand. You might find yourself uh, having to answer for what you're doing out there when you're supposed to be staying safe in your home. Or maybe you just observed it. Maybe you heard on the news that there were thousands of seemingly invincible young people who, in spite of all the government warnings, still went down and, and partied on the beach, not keeping to the, the social distancing guidelines. And wouldn't you know it, many of them who have come back now from that partying are now experiencing the symptoms and have been infected with COVID-19. Sin results in a reaction of suffering. We all know that. We, each of us, have suffered for our own sins. And so Jesus suffered. But he didn't suffer for his own sin because he had no sin. The Bible is clear on that. And yet he suffered. Why? Hebrews answers that too. God considered it fitting to bring the author of their salvation to his goal through sufferings. Many people are horrified by this. In fact, there's a, at least one false teacher who calls this cosmic child abuse, divine child abuse. Many people can't wrap their minds around the idea that God would not only allow his son to suffer, but would actually set it up, plan, orchestrate his son's suffering. Many people can't stomach the idea that God would actually force his son to suffer. But the, the problem with that line of thinking is that those people are either not taking the law seriously in that they must believe that that God doesn't really care about sin, that he may talk, he may, he may have a strong bark, but his bite is limited, that he doesn't really care about sin all that much, or they don't understand the gospel. They don't truly believe that when the Bible says that Jesus did in fact die for the sins of the whole world so that we might be saved. One or the other must be true, that, that they either don't take the law seriously or they don't understand the gospel. Because the fact of the matter is that the Bible makes it very clear. God is serious about sin. If you page ahead to Hebrews chapter 10, the author to Hebrews says it is a terrible thing to fall in the hands of a living God. And at the same time, the gospel is true too. The gospel is, is glorious as well. That if you, if you look ahead to 1 John chapter 2, Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the world. Both of those things are true. And so what we should understand from these words from Hebrews that God considered it fitting to cause his son to suffer was that there was no other way to save us. There was no other way to save us from the suffering in hell we deserved other than to cause Jesus to suffer. And so, in a wonderful way, the author of Hebrews shows us that it wasn't God's anger. It wasn't some parental fury that caused God to cause Jesus to suffer. It was his love. It was his boundless love for us. Jesus loved us so much that he chose to cause his son to suffer in our place so that we may not have to suffer what our sins deserve. How did Jesus suffer? That's the next question. Hebrews says, he suffered when he was tempted. I think it's easy for us to imagine that temptation was not really a big thing for Jesus, that he was kind of like a, a superman, and that the bullets of temptation just bounced off of his chest, and they didn't really affect him. And it's true, as son of God, as true God, Jesus certainly could have snapped his fingers and sent the devil back to the fiery lake of hell. He certainly could have done that. He certainly could have maintained his, his immunity to temptation. But as true man, he didn't. He was tempted. He was truly tempted. He suffered when he was tempted. Maybe we see that most clearly in the wilderness, when after 40 days of, of starving himself, of not eating anything, the devil came and tempted Jesus in those three sinister ways. He 
He tempted Jesus to give in to his own desires and use his, his power to make a meal out of rocks for himself. He tempted Jesus to, to a false trust of God and, and throwing himself off of the temple, uh, laying himself on the, the promise that, that God would, not, would send his angels and not let him strike his foot against a stone, to put God to the test. Finally, the, the devil came to Jesus and tempted him to avoid the cross and all the suffering that would come along with it and instead just bow down and worship him and then all of the kingdoms of the world could be his. And the de devil didn't leave Jesus alone after those days in the wilderness either. He kept coming back. He came back in the form of Peter, who after Jesus announced that he was going to Jerusalem and he was going to suffer and he was going to die at the hands of evil men, Peter came to him and said, no, Lord, that can't happen. It was a temptation from the devil, as Jesus makes clear in his response. Get behind me, Satan. The devil would show up again in the form of Judas. The devil would slither into that little hole in Judas' heart that, that greed had formed, that little crack that greed had formed, and fill it with the, the blackest darkness that's ever been seen in this world, leading to Judas doing the, the most evil thing that's ever been done, to betray the Son of God into the hands of his enemies. The devil would show up again in the, the lips of those crowds who would jeer at Jesus as he was hanging on the cross. They would say, if you truly are the Son of, God, Son of God, come down from that cross and we'll believe in you. Don't you think that would have been tempting for Jesus to use his power to come down from the cross and escape the suffering that our sins deserved? Of course it was. Jesus suffered when he was tempted. It was a real temptation. What that means is that because he overcame those temptations, now he's able to help you when you are tempted. He's able to strengthen you. And he knows what temptation is like. He knows what it's like when, when panic and frustration and anxiety and, and, and fear rise up in you, well up in you, and, and you don't know what to do with it. You know, just think of him in the Garden of Gethsemane when when he saw the suffering that his, his father had planned for him, the, the cup of wrath that, that was reserved only for the worst of sinners that he had to drink, Jesus bent down on his knees and his sweat was like drops of blood and he pleaded with his father, Father, if there is another way, but, but in obedience he said, not my will but yours be done. Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what, what you're going through. He can help you. He wants to help you. Ask him for help. He will give you strength. And, and in those times when you fall, when you give in to the temptations of the devil to, to fear a virus more than you fear God, to, to trust the government more than you trust God, to, to love whatever it is more than God, then Jesus will be there with forgiveness to raise you back up again. There's one more way that, that Jesus was like us. Since he shared our common blood, he also shared our common fate. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Hebrews puts it this way. So that through death he could destroy the one who had the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. I really had to think about this section as I was studying it this week. And, and the thought that kept coming up is, why, why do all of us, to a, to a person, generation after generation, even though we know that it hasn't turned out well for previous generations when they've turned to get away from God, why do we continue to do that? Why do we continue to serve the devil rather than serve God? What power does the devil have over us? And Hebrews' answer is that the devil has the power of death over us. See, the devil knows, as we should also, Romans 6.23, that the wages of sin is death. And the devil knows that as long as he can keep us sinning, he can keep hanging that dread, that fear of death over our heads. And as long as we're afraid of death, he can keep leading us to do 
sinful and foolish and self-destructive things. And don't we see that on, on display so clearly today? There's the, the, the mass panic, the, the hoarding of, of food and essential supplies, the, the, the chaos that is taking place in our world. Don't we see that the fear of death still has a strong grip on our world? Don't we see how many are driven to, to the point of, of behaving in crazy and insane ways because they fear death so much? Why else this, this desire, this frenzied cry, test me, test me, see if I have the virus, when in the end it doesn't matter whether you know you have it or not. We're all going to die from something. So, so what's the answer? What's the good news? The flip side of, of the fear of death that the devil has over us. Well, is it that we shouldn't be afraid? Should I tell you, don't be afraid of the COVID-19 virus? Don't worry about following any of those governmental restrictions, uh, keeping you at home and away from work. Don't, you don't have to wash your hands. It, it doesn't matter because you're going to die from something anyway. No. That's not good news. That would be foolish and that would be reckless. And that is not what anyone is saying. Rather, the good news is that Jesus tasted death for us. He came to earth and he looked like a slave. Isaiah 53 talks about how he was nothing to look at. How he didn't have the appearance of a savior. He had the appearance of a, a servant. But he was no slave to the devil. He was not enslaved to the devil because he had no sin. He was not under the devil's power because he did not fear death. In fact, Jesus embraced death. You know that he knew he was going to die and he willingly went into Jerusalem anyway. You know that even though he asked his father for another way to save us, he gladly took the cup of God's wrath and drank it down to the last drop. You know, and we will be reminded on Good Friday, that as Jesus gave up his final breath, it wasn't, it wasn't with fear, it wasn't with panic or anxiety, but it was fearless. It was full of trust in his Father's plan and his Father's will and his Father's love as he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And by dying, Jesus swallowed death. Jesus destroyed death. By, by taking away our sins by his death, death no longer has any power over us. The devil can't hold it over our heads and use it to control us, to make us his slaves. Because where there is no sin, and that's what you heard in the absolution, your sin has been removed, forgiven. Where there is no sin, Death has no ultimate consequences. It is not ultimately separation from God. It is, in fact, the gateway to heaven for believers. There is no reason for believers to fear death any longer because it is through death that Jesus takes us to eternal life. And in the end, that's, that's why Jesus shared our blood. He came to this earth. He he took on a, a human body. He shared our blood. He, he suffered. He was tempted. He died to free us from the fear of death, to free us from the fear of hell, to free us from the control of the devil. So it's good. It's a good thing that we would celebrate Annunciation Day today. And Lord willing... In nine short months, we can gather together here once again to celebrate Christmas. It's so important to keep in mind that Jesus became a human. He shared our blood to, to free us, to save us. He, he was tempted. He suffered. He died to free us from our suffering, from our temptations, and from the fear of our death. And if Jesus has freed us from the fear of death, if, if we have no fear of dying because we know that he has provided a way for us to have eternal life with him in heaven, then there's really nothing else to fear either, is there? We don't have to be afraid 
of, of an invisible virus. We don't have to be afraid that we're going to run out of the essentials. We don't have to be afraid that we're going to run out of toilet paper. We don't have to be afraid of this societal chaos. Because we know that if Jesus has power over death, he has power over all of this as well. It's good that we celebrate Annunciation Day today. The fact that God, the Son of God, became a man and shared our blood. Because he has defeated our, our suffering, our temptation, and our death. So that now, there's no reason to be afraid. There is every reason for us today and every day to be confident and fearless and grateful for what the Son of God has done for us. So let me be the first and and maybe the only person today to wish you a happy Annunciation Day. Amen. We continue with our responsive prayer of the church. Holy and righteous God, we confess that we have earned your righteous wrath and anger by our rebellious actions, our unkind and untruthful words, and our impure and selfish thoughts. Lord, have mercy on us. During the season of Lent, impress on us once more the mercy you have shown us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who bore the bitter pain and suffering our sins deserve. In love, you sent him into the world as the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Christ, have mercy on us. God of grace and mercy, you have worked in our hearts the faith to believe the good news that eternal freedom from sin's curse is a gift of your grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. May your spirit continue to be with us as we follow the way of the cross and renew in us zeal to serve you by reflecting your love to all people. Lord, have mercy on us. Amen. We pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We also join in Luther's evening prayer. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. Forgive me all my sins and graciously keep me this night. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you once again for joining us for this remote worship service opportunity. As as you know from the latest stay-at-home restriction, the mandate, Uh, We will likely be continuing to worship in this fashion for the next several weeks at least. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for putting up with this distance that has been created between us. But I hope you also appreciate the fact that uh, while while much of life has changed, the Word of God has not changed, and and we can still hear and benefit from it. And, And as a result of knowing that Jesus shared our blood, we have no reason to fear all of the the things that are happening in the world around us. Again, we're going to try to continue to uh, make these as, as well done as possible. If that includes music in the upcoming weeks, we will certainly uh, try our best to do so, and especially during our Holy Week services. But who knows what the Lord has in plan. Maybe by the time Palm Sunday rolls around, we'll be able to gather uh, in person for worship. May that be our prayer. It would be great to see you once again rather than just be seen by you. Until then. God bless, trust Jesus, and wash your hands.